Okay, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you for joining us for this talk on redefining our domestic spaces. We're talking about redefining our domestic spaces in the wake of the pandemic and also other future trends which are shaping our housing needs. And I'm here with Renee Searle, who's director of Threefold Architects, James Bidwell, who's co-founder of Reset, and David Schill, who's marketing director at Aritco. And each are going to give a little presentation about their work, and then we're going to go into a discussion about various topics related to redefining our domestic space. So um, James is going to start. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, nice to see you. Good to see some people have already got Camparis, which I think is very advisable. I think the speakers should have them. But anyway, that's another story. So, um, maybe later. So thanks so much. Um, I'm James. I have two businesses. I have um, Reset, which is a strategy consultancy for innovation and sustainability, and Springwise, which is... Um, a global innovation platform, which is, um, and we partner with Aritco to create uh, this, apart from other things. So you can see, and we look at innovations all around the world. We're a B Corp, uh, both of our businesses, and one, members of 1% for the planet. Um, I wrote a book called Disrupt 100 Lessons in Business Innovation, if you're interested. David said it's very good. And then we also, we collaborate um, seriously to help uh, Horizon Scan and think about innovation around the topics that are important to our clients and partners such as Aritco. And we love doing that. We love glimpsing the future. It's really nice to be in this space, which I think is quite a futuristic space. I think it's the first time that it's even been open, but it's fantastic to see you all live. Um, I'll show a couple of innovations just to see which uh, are in, the, in this. This is really to encourage you to read the little brochure. But we're looking at um, innovations that are going to define the way we live in the future. And there's lots around wellness and well-being, both mental and physical, and how does the home evolve and adapt? And that's kind of the conversation that we will trigger this afternoon. So I hand over now to, you're gonna, I'm gonna hand that to you, okay. and the microphone to you. Oops. Lovely to be here. Go back one slide. Sorry, back, back, one back one Hello, hi, I'm Renee. Okay. I'm director of Threefold Architects, working in designing spaces for living and working. Um, started off uh, in working for domestic clients, working with individuals and families wanting to shape and tailor their homes to the way that they live, where the study, the studio, the desk on the landing or the courtyard garden was once a luxury, but now seems to be more of a necessity um, after the last couple of years. We also work um, in workspace and we've been working with leading workspace providers, um, the Crown Estate and Airbnb for about eight or nine years now, pioneering ideas around agile working, integrating technology into our workspaces so that we no longer need fixed desks, task-based working, and also incorporating um, communality within our workspaces to foster collaboration, crossover, and wellness. So we also work in designing um, new homes. We've been working with local authorities to develop uh, new residential buildings that have a focus on um, community that embed themselves within their context and their environments that have a responsibility to the, um, to the environment. So this one uh, is a little video. I don't know if it can play, but I'll explain right. it anyway. It was a response Early. to a uh, competition for the Davidson Prize earlier this year, which was about redefining our workspaces from home. And it was a, a, a critique on our current housing design standards, which uh, define our minimum space standards for living, and they currently don't provide any workspace. Um, they, they define things like outdoor amenity space, the size of our bedrooms. But beyond that, there's very little call for spaces that um, encourage work or, or outside of our dwellings. This is an opportunity to put some of those ideas into fruition. It's a 50-50 commercial and residential uh, project in Boreham Wood, so a commuter-led town, where there's uh, equal provision of workspace, co-working, and workshop studios for which the residents of the development have access to as part of, of, of the deal. And finally, we've been working with other developer organizations who are trialing different modes of, of living, so pocket-sized units for a generation with less stuff, um, enabling young people to get on the housing ladder um, at affordable prices, but providing generous amenity spaces generous lobbies and entrances, places to work, and high-quality landscaped gardens. That means me. Yeah. Uh, my name is David Schill. I'm the marketing director of a lift company called Aritko Lift, coming out of Sweden. So we are uh, one of the leaders in the industry of doing smart lift solutions. We are 
manufacturing around 4,000 lifts per year coming out of Stockholm, uh, spreading all over the world in different ways. Uh, for us, it is uh, extremely important to focus on a few things, uh, sustainability being one, of course. Uh, we're very known for our sleek design uh, coming out of Scandinavia. Safety is a very important part, similar to a car, I know, um, and a little bit of uh, smart solutions. And why we are trying to focus on these ones is that we foresee that these are extremely interesting and relevant for for different types of audiences coming in in especially home but also in commercial and public uh, ecosystem being a part of a future ecosystem uh, for us is extremely important to understand what then is happening so that's why we collaborate with companies like uh, like these, uh, and especially then, of course, uh, with James and the Spring, Springwise team, uh, trying to make reports of understanding what is changing, what is coming around, and then sharing that to understand, okay, how will we be able to be relevant in that type of uh, ecosystem? Uh, so that's why we did this one. Uh, we did a new, uh, the first one in January, the future of the home together. Uh, and uh, if you do the digital version of this one, there are some links to go back to the old one too. And there will be a few new ones uh, together also coming around. So uh, I think this is a good way of trying to stay on your toes yep. to actually understand how you can become relevant. These are different type of typical environments that our lifts are coming around in. Uh, you can probably take one or two more. Understanding suddenly how people are living and using and what kind of needs they have when, when uh, they are developing their living it's not easy. We have to study some of these uh, families. We go to China. This one sits in China. Another one sitting uh, in a small boutique hotel. And uh, this is an office in somewhere in Germany. And uh, the last one sitting in a restaurant in Norway. So finding sleek solutions that actually is getting us out of uh, the unsustainable world of concrete. Uh, because what we're trying to do is to mix recyclable material uh, together uh, with a mechanical engineering and digitalization to be also having smart solutions and getting out of the old uh, non-recyclable world to get into smart solutions, small spaces with, with something that actually can be sustain sustainable over time. Okay, thank you all three. Um, so my first question to, to our panel is really um, the, the, the solutions that are in the, the booklet are kind of design-based solutions. So we're thinking about you know, extensions of products which could save us space in the home or function as a workspace but then be put away at the end of the day. And Renee, you're talking more about making space within the home, an architectural solution to, to making space within the home for work. So I was wondering, do we think the solutions to kind of making our homes suddenly double up as workspaces, is the solution a kind of product, product design based one or is it an architectural one? I think it's both. Yeah. I mean, our technology has um, enabled us to work, you know, laptops, high speed connections, um, anywhere remotely for quite a long time. So we've been quite well advanced in terms of our technological abilities to work. But our homes, um, our environments at home haven't quite caught up to the same pace. So to work from home at the moment might mean that you don't necessarily have the right height of desk or the right chair or the right airflow or the best type of light or the best acoustics or privacy. So there's definitely a space for smart technologies to fill that gap. Um, but I also think there's a kind of wider conversation to review um, where we are in terms of our space standards because they're out of date yeah. um, and they refer back to a, a report which was um, issued in 1961 which was the last time a, a major shift in our space standards occurred which was to integrate a bathroom into the house and yeah. to have storage for a kitchen and a boiler. Yeah. So we're at that stage now that actually this thing of us you know, merging our 
living and working, I think, is here to stay for some time. So I think a review of space standards is crucial. Yeah. And James, how did you sort of go about the uh, finding these solutions that are in the report? Um, so what we do is we have, um, we have thousands of people around the world. We call them spring spotters who are basically their job is to search for these ideas and then they send them in to us and we review them and the editor decides which of the top three are published every single day on our website um, or on the app. So, so we specifically said, let's look at this topic and sent out the call to um, our spring spotters around the world in the Springwise network and asked them to come back. And then, and then I guess it's in collaboration and you know looking at the kind of the core topics that we might want to discuss and trying to understand where the pressure points are and where and what will trigger an interesting conversation around it. So so that's how we do it. Um, look, I think we are still in a transition period in this kind of post-COVID world. So we, we're we all tentatively, we were just talking about how London has sort of suddenly sprung to life in the last week and everyone's out and no one bothers wearing a mask on the tube anymore hardly. And, you know, we've sort of come out of this time and then, you know, from being at home and everyone I think is r responding to the freedom and therefore it's uncertain what is going to be the role of the home and working in the home and there's it's also uncertain of as to what's going to happen in offices and i spend a lot of time with property owners and developers and they're as unclear as everyone else the interesting thing is um how do we design for the future how do we design products for the future how do we design spaces for the for the future and how do we build in agility and how do we build in, build in flexibility? And I think what's interesting about some of these ideas is they're very flexible. And you know, just the thought of you know, getting rid of the laptops at the, you know, and hiding them behind a photograph or, a, or, a, or something on the wall and um, you know, being able to adapt. And as we, in urban environments globally, will be living in smaller spaces, likely as the po population grows, how do we think about that? And then, and therefore, very smart, designed in, is, is I think from a product and architectural and of course, governance point of view. Yeah. Be because I think uh, just picking up where, where you are, James, I think it's very much of the flexibility of each product. We work, for instance, with a, a designer, Alexander Levik, a Scandinavian designer, who just recently had a full series of furniture that actually you know, could turn from being a working space. This is my working room today, but tonight it got to be my dinner the set yeah so the the working table got to be a sideboard and uh, uh, there were different types of uh, attributes in here that you actually can fa facilitate more things at the same time yeah. uh, talking about then different types of solutions for that I think technology as well as design as well as then of course how do you fit them in architecture will always be in composition with each other yeah, yeah. And I guess uh, product design and spatial solutions can, can maybe fix things in the short term, but uh, trying to get, get workspace involved in the home from a planning standards point of view is going to take a lot longer. <laughs> so if we, I mean, the, the pandemic has given us this great opportunity to rethink everything that's not been working in our homes. And another trend that we're looking at is intergenerational housing. So if we do make extra space in the home for work, what else could it function as for different members of the family? And what, what does it become when we're not working at the weekends and the evenings? How can we kind of get the most out of already quite a tight space at home? How, how can we get the most out of it? I, I think once again, I think it's uh, you have to find uh, solutions and technologies uh, designed in there that actually can turn the full space to something new. We see the need for actually uh, not only working and, and, uh, and leisure time, but also for recreational time. We had uh, uh, different types of solutions when we looked at uh, uh, housing for the future or homes in the future, where, where you actually need to cater for your vacation if you need to stay at home. And, and uh, technology solutions that they will take you to Iceland on a tour, a digital tour together with others, where you have a tour leader and you're exploring Iceland from your living room. So I think here, uh, all of the different technologies and products needs to do that work for you. Uh, and then the room can become anything. It yeah. can become the leisure room, it can be the recreational room, and you can uh, 
but tomorrow it's my working space anyhow. So I think it is the furniture uh, uh, and, of course, the technology that can bring it. And by utilizing them in our ecosystem, I think it can become anything. I suppose I'm interested in, in the future of housing models and um, how we set our br briefs and the responsibility with those providing housing to think more widely about the provision um, and to think about the communities that housing goes into and who, who lives there, what the need is. Um, and there's a real call for mixing, to, to introduce more of a mix of use, to not just have solely residential blocks that can often be um, uninviting at ground floor level, have no active frontage. So to incorporate generous spaces that provide additional amenity for people living within urban blocks um, is a benefit for all, I think. Yeah. And flexible. So I think the, the key word is, you know, living communities and how do people live together and how are we going to construct our living spaces in this new world? So I'm, I commute sometimes and it's the worst thing going up and down on the train from, you know, the countryside into London. I think there's about 30% of the amount of people on the train now, you know, as there were before, before the pandemic. So how are people, how are we going to, keep the energy of these kind of meetings which we love to actually see people in in real life um as well as you know avoid some of the things we don't really like and what is that going to do to communities both urban and rural um i think that's going to be a fascinating ongoing debate i mean none of this is none of this is kind of linear or predictable and i can see lots of young people who i guess are thinking about design for the future which is very encouraging in in the audience here because the, you know, it's going to be all about, about how we design and how we design with flexibility built in and that agility. And the inter intergenerational concept is really interesting. My kids definitely don't want to live with me. They want to live, uh, you know, on their own with their mates. And yeah. um, so I don't know, you know, that's a whole other, whole other piece. And I don't think we know all the answers, but what we can do is we can look out and horizon scan, if you like. I, I didn't say that all the Springwise ideas are actually happening, so yeah. they're not just kind of someone pr trying to do a concept. It is something that is happening somewhere. Maybe it's a startup or an academic coming up, you know, bringing this to market. So thinking about and taking inspiration, I think, is, is the kind of way to go. And if we are planning a kind of radical uh, redefinition of our domestic spaces, how do we make sure we're taking everyone with us? Because obviously the pandemic has highlighted a, an inequality in... in you know, working from home isn't possible for everybody. Some people are living in rented accommodation or shared accommodation. And the, um, how do we kind of, you know, if we are going to use this as a moment of transformation, how do we make sure we're as inclusive as possible? Uh, I, I think there are many, uh, many multi-story buildings or multi-family buildings or uh, that are now I see already preparing their common spaces or, or creating common spaces. Uh, not maybe everybody who lives in a one or two room apartment have the possibility then to have, uh, have a working space and a living room and a bedroom. And so they, they just decided to take some part of the house to have a common working space. So I, I, I think in, in, in this way, we will see more and more of uh, people living together finding more common areas yeah. uh, um, we will have a densif continuous densification of the city so we also need to find more more space for being outdoors and possibly then as we've been speaking about before there needs to be more rooftop gardens and and uh, uh, I can't have a rooftop garden of my own, possibly. So I need to share it with some. Otherwise, yeah. it's not going to work in the future. Yeah. And then, of course, we need to find these. What kind of things do we then need to share? Yeah. And how do we build up these common spaces? And how do we get access for everyone? Because the multi-generational living will happen in multi-story fa family houses. Yeah. So even old aunt need to be able to get up there. Yeah, I mean, I think community is key, and I mm. think that's one thing I think most people can probably take away from the last couple of years is our lo local community um, and how we've responded to each other when we've all been so close. And it comes back to really understanding um, the community that you're designing for when, when you commence a project, um, understanding its context, the place, 
understanding it, a place in terms of its environment, understanding what will happen to it in the future. So a kind of a more joined up approach to developing buildings rather than, I mean, it's not okay to just put a sort of generic affordably built product um, that has no reference to its context anymore. I mean, I think if you look in the UK um, at sort of affordable in inverted commas housing housing and these block these houses that are built all over the place and sort of they're awful they're terrible they're extraordinarily bad design they are the property developers are making a fortune based on government loopholes and it's a disgrace and there's no imagination in any of the design in any of these places i mean i'm being a bit uh, you know generalization but you can look at these places and you say how did how did they come up with that and the answer is the property guys are making a fortune and the government are trying to build more houses and they have no, there's no connectivity between an imaginative design driven new housing estate it's just let's get them up and tick the boxes and and make money so fundamental change in that paradigm is is fundamental to solving this this problem and it's such a shame when you see something in a beautiful place that could be designed differently to build new communities and new ways of living and I think the communal side of it really interesting but uh, that needs some intervention from yeah. the politicians and, and we're not getting it at the moment in this country yeah and we'll go on to talk about sort of more communal living but I just wanted to to put here um, we're also obviously talking about working from home but what else does our home what's what else has the pandemic made us realize we need in our homes and you mentioned rooftop gardens and I know Renee you've spoke about well-being, wellness at home. So if we're introducing kind of different modes of living at home, is there anything that we should also be thinking about as well as making space for work? What we have seen in some of the studies uh, is the importance of having clear borders. Yeah. So everything is not just blending into one big mess of working, leisure, uh, spare time, whatever, you know. So uh, I think here uh, it can be uh, the, the ideas for the future must help us to create these borders of here, now I get, go into working mode, now I go into leisure mode. Uh, and uh, I think the borders are more important than actually the needs of observing um, uh, in architecture serving different types of, of purposes because I think that as I said before that the, the products and technology can overcome that I mean I, I just say in nature yeah. you know we've we, we, we all I think some a lot of people have had time to reflect and I think there's been, when we've been allowed out in London in the parks and to go and walk I mean they're completely packed because we're we kind of we need nature, and I think building nature into the into the home and building ways of plant have plants and you know with there's all sorts of the vertical farming at, at scale, but in in our individual homes having that connection with Mother Nature and with the Earth has a almost a counterpoint to all this tech. You know, it's all fine to watch Netflix all day and play Fortnite if you're some of my kids, but you know actually the the amazing force that nature is in terms of from a well-being and mental health and kind of just aesthetically actually much nicer than a lot of the stuff that we create ourselves frankly um, so let's have that into into our homes yeah I think it's interesting what you say David about borders because I think um, for a lot of people work and life and space for playing and space for exercise has all just become one big un uh, big tangle of, of, of mess, really. We're not using our spaces in the most efficient way. But obviously another sort of trend is co-housing, communal housing, is, is our mixed-use developments where there's some co-working next to some residential space. Is that a better way of establishing kind of uh, a divide between the working day and the, and the home life? Yeah, I, mean, I think so. I think it's a really exciting, um, exciting place to be. And... You know, James touched on it earlier that um, that model will transform our um, suburbs as well as our city centres. Um, seeing a kind of, you know, our, our city centres will have to adapt to be something else other than the place that we go to every day. But our our suburbs are, are somewhere where we can work close to our homes, um, and I think that's a really exciting typology that's emerging as part of this. Um, and we, I 
so I th we just did, um, uh, we published a report on the 15-minute city and on Springwise, which I mean, maybe talk about it, but, but all the innovations around that and these kind of hyper-local communities, I think are really, really interesting and, and having, the, having the, you know, being able to sort of share the workspace and share the home space a little bit, I think that's a, that's a fascinating, um, fascinating development and I think we'll see much more of that, um, yeah. so, which is really good. I think the 15-minute city is probably where we need to head. Uh, not only because I think uh, this is a good way of healthy living, not always go downtown town to actually visit job and then commute, etc., etc. But from a sustainability purpose, this is the only way. Um, uh, you can see some of the... I, I think in, in, in Netherlands they've been quite good in finding different changes of total cities actually uh, one of them in, in Rotterdam that is really changing the environment where you suddenly don't need that central road any longer because you can actually within 15 minutes reach everything that you need uh, and then suddenly you say yeah but we need to exchange experience we need to, to meet people etc etc yeah but there there will be possibilities for that uh, in, in in different ways but day life within 15 minutes, I think that is the key answer. And do you think now is the time for the 15 minute city concept? Because it's been talked about before, we have more hyper-local activity, we reduce the need to commute, re reduce the need for transport, you know, everything is walkable or cyclable, um, but it's never quite happened before. Um, so do you think now the pandemic has made us realize the potential of what's on our doorstep, we have more opportunity to not have to work in an office anymore. Could this be the, its, its moment where it takes off? It's a very political as well as <laughs> a economical question, I guess. Yeah. Because the, uh, if, if you look at the, what's happening in China right now, with, with uh, uh, many of the big uh, development companies, real estate companies, are, are having trouble. We could see it just recently this week. Uh, because they are not allowed to build as much as they have been building before. Yeah? They are bound with, from, the, from the Chinese government to actually start looking into uh, revitalizing old buildings and regenerative design. Because there are too many empty, new, newly built empty buildings, so you can't build anymore. Uh, okay, that, hap what will, that will of course drive a densification of the cities automatically because they need to regenerate for new purposes. So yeah, maybe that's one way by a political statement or, or direction to give the 15 minute city a uh, opportunity. Uh, the other one is to drive uh, probably through financials and not everybody can live on the countryside. Uh, having all the nice areas around and, and utilizing the green areas and, and grow their own gardens, etc. It's not sustainable uh, and in many ways and uh, there is no land for us all. So uh, automatically if those prices go up, of course it will drive people into a densification. So, uh, yeah, uh, there are different ways, I think. Uh, maybe not all that popular, though. Look, I, I mean, now is as good as any time, and, uh, and um, whether we'll do it, if, if you look at London, you walk around, the, 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 the streets are full of cars. Uh, those cars are used 10% of the time maximum. You know, they're just sitting on, you know, chunks of metal sitting on the street. Now, in a 15-minute city, city model, you wouldn't need cars. However, there are powerful lobbying groups um, on working on behalf of the car companies to you know, make sure that we all need cars. So, so there does need to be some fairly radical kind of intervention from government and from, from city governments. And I'm a big fan of city governments who can really make a big difference because they can pilot, um, pilot things in cities, which national governments don't often want to do. So what we need is we need some innovators and some pioneers to prove the model. And, and, I, and I think, you know, there are, there's emerging um, kind of thinking around this and pilot schemes happening. And then that, you know, whether that can become my mainstream is, is a whole other, whole other matter. But from a climate point of view, without a doubt, you know, this models that reduce the requirement for massive energy consumption have got to be, you know, have got to be front and center. And yeah, I completely agree. I, mean, I think it's a really exciting time for out-of-town hubs and a really exciting time for city centres to be greener, 
to be more pedestrian friendly, to be more environmentally friendly, and to be destinations for um, non-work um, as we sort of enter this hybrid time. I think it's, it's definitely a time to pilot some schemes and, and master plans for Oxford Circus and you know, much of the Crown Estate land is all thinking about that kind of stuff already. Yeah, and um, we seem to, obviously the pandemic is one crisis, but we seem to be living in a time where we're lurching from crisis to crisis. We have layers of, of uncertainty in the future. So how do we future-proof our buildings, both our existing buildings and the new buildings, the new developments, to kind of face this uncertainty in terms of the climate, in terms of changing ways of living. It's obviously not sustainable to be rethinking everything on a cyclical basis. How can we kind of uh, use this opportunity to, to take our buildings and sort of make them more agile, more fit for, for any kind of future uncertainty that, that might occur? Is there, are there strategies that among you that you've, you've found? I think um, we've all got responsibility to look after our planet on a sort of individual level, to consume less, to use, reuse more, to recycle. And in terms of procuring our buildings, to, to think about the whole life cycle of a project from, from its inception to, to what happens to it in the future in terms of waste. Um, so there's a real call to integrate, again, that thinking, uh, and we have the technology to do it. You know, with, with software, we can, be, we can be understanding what components of our buildings can be used at a later time. And partnering with, with contractors to think about what they do when they demolish a building. Do we need to demolish buildings anymore? Should we never be demolishing buildings and, and working with existing and adding to? So I think there's a responsibility across the board I mean, I, th I think completely agree, and you know, it's it's about designing it in, yeah. and designing it in from the beginning. Uh, we do a lot of work on uh, ask and, in helping organisations embed sustainability into the core business strategy, so not have it on the edge, but having it in the strategy. Once it's in the business purpose, it's much easier to to deal with because then you're you know you're looking through your kind of vision, and it's it's in there and. A proxy, and we do a lot of work also in fashion, and, and, if, and if you design clothes to be recycled, to be repaired, to, you know, to not have to be washed so much, and all of those kind of things, you, you, start, you have to start at the design, um, you know, the design stage, and, and that's why design's so important in all of this. I'm sure you'd, you'd agree with that. David. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and in addition, then make a con uh, construct uh, things or, or, or create things or, or develop things that are actually from the beginning thought through as a life cycle. So not only am I creating it because it should then do uh, some kind of a, uh, having a, a, a good uh, level of sustainability when it's used but what will happen afterwards, yeah? How will it be able to taken care of or become something else uh, when actually this life cycle is finalized? I would like to also add another aspect, and I think uh, a little bit uh, a part of, of seeing what's come, uh, well, how, how to understand how to build this into the future is also to be curious. Uh, very curious about how people think, what they need, how they develop their ways of, of living, what is important for them, and, and continuously then be curious about uh, what is around the corner. Uh, because then we will stay on our toes to actually be able to be relevant and drive things forward. If we stop driving things forward, uh, falling backwards. Um, and Renee, architects obviously have to think about the long-term future more perhaps than product designers. So, um, and you mentioned lifetime homes it used to be a, a requirement of a lot of new housing and that's building in the capability for a house to, to have someone age in the house and not have to f find new accommodation. Um, but that's gone by the wayside, you mentioned. So um, how do we make sure these things stay on the agenda when we're sort of you know, trying to sort of firefight a little bit in response to lots of crises? I think they are on the agenda. And I think that, you know, in the last 15, 20 years, the word sustainable design has been in our vocabulary as, as what we should be thinking about, whereas there's a shift to, to the phrase regenerative design, which is not just about our components 
for building, which we have improved upon the way that we build and making our buildings consume less energy. But we have to do more than that now. Um, we have to kind of consume less energy than our building um, needs, and we need to give back to the environment. And also, we, there's a value associated with a social value, um, which is a, quite a new thing, I think. Are designers and architects becoming more conscious of um, of the sort of people behind using the buildings? I think there's or? always, I think we've always been conscious of them, yeah. but I think that there's a genuine um, backing for, for architects to use their voice to influence our clients and to guide our clients um, about the bigger picture rather than just about designing the building. Yeah. And then understanding that the norms are changing yeah. continuously. Uh, uh, UK is uh, right now one of the major countries in Europe where we see multi-generational living happening. That was an Asian thing for many of yeah. us. Uh, but now this is really coming true uh, in uh, lots of countries where UK is one of the leading ones when it comes to, you know, you, you live in multiple generations and how do you cater for that in your both uh, setup of architecture, uh, what you need to accommodate, etc., etc., mm -hmm. And make it available for everyone. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, I think we'll leave it there unless anybody um, has anything else they want to add to the conversation or are there any questions from the, from the floor? I just wondered, um, thank you as well for your, for your chat because it's, it's really, really, really been insightful. I just wondered, um, I'm conscious as my role as an interior designer um, of changes given the COVID, uh, given what we've gone through. At both ends of the spectrum are young people and the need for mental space, if I'm completely honest, um, and also our older generation who have lost connection, actually, with like-minded peers for fear of what's, what we've gone through. And despite sort of our efforts on vaccines and things, which is fantastic, I can't help but think that that connection is still going to be something that we need to promote within all of our... Sort of any sort of forms of architecture and space planning, whether it be interior or exterior, you know, as a whole. And I just wondered on your thoughts on that, really, in terms of anything that you've started to think about in terms of your projects that you're working on, um, because, you know, it, they may actually just be really helpful to know. <laughs> sure. I mean, I think the, the front, the, the doorstep for many people over the last couple of years has been a very, very valuable threshold um, and that idea, which goes a little bit back to the space standards idea about these extra spaces that might not be within our homes, but are just tucked next to our homes or within our communities, within our shared spaces, which become really important, um, whether they're gardens or places to share or a room that you can book for a, a family event or a space that you can work within the lobby of your apartment block that activate these extra places which aren't currently valuable in terms of a developer because they're expensive. So I think that for me is a really exciting place for design and for those spaces to emerge. On the aspect where we also ended a little bit the talk, uh, it's all about to find how do I make it available then for all the different generations to take part being a little bit biased then, maybe it's so that we need to have a lift for grandma if she is going to live here. And maybe it does not work if we buy a full concrete shaft and, and a lot of waste, etc. So we need to have a small smart one. But it fits in because it, the kids can have it and play with when they're going on the rooftop or whatever, they can carry things. So I think there are many different solutions that actually can tie the generations together, if you just think about, okay, how do we make it available uh, for everyone to take part in the communal spaces and the, and the added spaces that uh, I know the property owners don't like, but we want to have them. Uh, and just from our point of view, we're seeing both ends of the, the spectrum on Springwise, you know, we're seeing innovation and ideas coming through, but particularly in the elder age groups and, and you know, longer lifespans and all of those kind of things and creating spaces and, and kind of creativity and in design which is um, catering for, for, for people who want to stay at home longer and can stay along, at home longer who are fitter. And then there's also a connection between the health agenda and the home. So, the, so how, do you, how do you do more of 
the sort of the, towards the end of life kind of healthcare in the home and how does that get designed in so that your home doesn't end up looking like a hospital, you know, it, it, for all of those sorts of things, which I think are, you know, all very human. And I think at the essence of this whole conversation is, is humanity. And as we come out of the whole pandemic is, you know, we're all human and design should be for humans, not for technology. Technology is an enabler and all of that is very useful, but we are individuals and we are humans. And I think that's what we, I think we'd all agree that it's the most important thing. Totally, and uh, talking about that, our next little deep dive will be on health. Yeah. So there we go. Thought I'd trail that for us, David. <laughs> Great, well thank you. I think we'll thank you for your um, time this afternoon and your really interesting thoughts on this topic. And thanks everybody for, for listening. I think it's been a really interesting conversation. Um, so yes, our thanks to the panel. Thank you. And thanks everyone and enjoy the rest of the event. Mm -hmm.